Today we're going to talk about a topic that is at the heart of the philosophy of religion. We're going to talk about what is called theodicy, the question of justifying God's behavior given the existence of evil. How does a good, powerful God allow evil to exist? We look at the tragedies going on in the modern world. We look at Russia uh, moving in on Ukraine and the innocent civilians and children of Ukraine being killed in the streets of their home. And we ask, how could a good God allow that? The president of Ukraine came on television and said that God was on their side. But if a good God is on their side, why can such horrific evil happen? It's a question that's existed throughout the history of the world, and one of the earliest and most powerful statements of it came from a Greek philosopher named Epicurus. Epicurus is recorded as having said, God either wants to eliminate bad things and cannot, or can, but does not want to, or neither wishes to, nor can, or both wants to and can. If he wants to and cannot, then he is weak. And this does not apply to God. If he can but does not want to, then he is spiteful, which is equally foreign to God's nature. If he neither wants to nor can, he is both weak and spiteful, and so not a God. If he wants to and can, which is the only fitting thing for a God, where then do bad things come from? Or why does he not eliminate them? Uh, the, the question is, how do we logically see the coherence of a good God a powerful God, and the existence of evil. Well, there are three general approaches to this question that philosophers and theologians tend to take. And I find it easiest to think about this uh, by way of an analogy. Imagine you take a, uh, a pie out of the refrigerator. I, I like to make key lime pies. And so let's say I take a key lime pie out of the refrigerator. It's, it's ready to eat, but I want to transfer it from a pie tin to a serving plate so I can take it to the dinner table. And I realize the, the pie tin is a bit bigger than the plate. And I, I'm not sure that the, the pie, once I take it out of the tin, is going to fit on the plate. So I cut the pie into three big pieces. And I, I then assume I can sort of wiggle them around a little bit. Well, I go to put the three pieces of pie on the plate, and the problem is I can fit the first one on fine. There's lots of room for it. The second one I can kind of squeeze in around it, but when then I go to put the third piece of pie on the plate, it doesn't fit. It hangs off the side. The plate clearly is not going to accommodate all three. Now I can try to rearrange those and take them back off again and maybe start with pie, uh, piece number three, and work my way back to one, but whichever piece I try to put in last just isn't going to go in there all that well. And that's how theodicy works. When we deal with the goodness of God and the power of God and the existence of evil, one of those three pieces just sort of hangs off the side at the, at the end of the discussion. There's usually a, a value that we're most committed to, and that one goes in first. And then of the other two, there's one that we'll accept, and we squeeze that in next. But the, the one we're least comfortable with, or have the, the most trouble explaining, well, it tends to hang off the side of the plate when we're done. I'll show you what I mean. As we approach this issue, philosophers trying to reconcile these three uh, presumably uh, incompatible uh, uh, values uh, generally try to diminish one of them. Some philosophers have tried to diminish the existence of evil because that's the one they like the least. They want a good God, and they want a powerful God, so they try to say that evil is just somehow not all that bad. If you go back to the early Christian church in the, uh, in the second century, uh, there was a philosopher, a theologian named Irenaeus. And Irenaeus seemed to see the sufferings of this world as a matter of soul making. The things that we go through help to develop us into the people that God means for us to be. After all, without trials, we'd never learn patience. Without burden, we'd never learn forgiveness. 
Uh, we, we have to go through the sufferings of this world in order to develop the virtues that God wants to shape within us. And so evil somehow is not quite all that bad. It's a tool in the hands of God to be used for the shaping of our characters. You might compare this to a sculptor carving a statue out of a block of marble. The marble has to be chipped at fairly forcefully in order to bring the statue out of it. And in the same way, God is trying to shape our characters to make us into the people that he means for us to be. The problem is that some evil does not generate good results. Imagine a degenerative mental disease in which a person's mind deteriorates until they die. Well, their character is not thereby improving, they're actually losing the use of their faculties. Or imagine horrific, a broad spread evil like the Holocaust, where millions of people are killed brutally. How is their character improved through such horrible suffering? Or couldn't there be a better way to improve people's character than to allow such horrible widespread suffering. Another uh, philosopher who tried to go the same route and diminish evil to say evil wasn't quite so bad was John Calvin, the Protestant reformer of the 16th century. Calvin said that everything that happens is absolutely caused by God. None of it is merely allowed. It's all intentionally made to happen by God. Calvin would say that every single raindrop that falls from the sky falls along the trajectory that God makes it fall along, God causes it to fall along, and God causes it to land exactly on the ground where God wants it to land. Everything is in God's hand. God is completely sovereign. Therefore, if people suffer, it is because God willed it, not that he merely allowed it. And Calvin would say, if we had God's view on things, if we could see the entirety of the world, the entirety of history, we would understand that evil was so purposeful that it was necessary. That in fact, it would not be something we would reject, we'd simply accept it as God's work. And so for Calvin, there is some kind of secret mystery to the, the knowing of God, to the way God sees the world, that's too big for us. And if only we could see it, we would realize evil really doesn't even exist. Uh, that's a, 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 another way of, of playing down the matter of evil. Uh, one of the more popular versions of this kind of theodicy came from a German philosopher named Gottfried Leibniz in the 17th century. Uh, he's a, a Renaissance philosopher. Um, and uh, and uh, he uh, wrote a book. Uh, in which he described uh, the world around us and said that it's the best of all possible worlds. That even with all the suffering that goes on, this is the, the best world we could possibly have. And from all the various options God could have chosen, God chose the best one. The one that uh, held together best and was the most sensible and produced the most good. Well, this, uh, this philosophy got uh, sarcastically uh, lambasted by another philosopher named uh, Voltaire, who wrote a book called Candide, about a guy who goes through all kinds of horrible suffering and yet somehow tries to maintain the idea that this is still the best of all possible worlds. Voltaire meant to say that from pr the practical experience of human life, it's absolutely absurd to say that this world is wonderful. There's simply far too much suffering within it. So that's one approach, to diminish the issue of evil, to make evil not so grand, not so terrible. And some philosophers find that easy to palate, and some find it impossible. A second approach would be to diminish God's power, to assume that God isn't quite so powerful. I read one Jewish rabbi who was writing after the Holocaust, and he said that God is good and somehow limited in his ability to affect this world. The reason terrible things happen is because God's, God's power is not fully uh, at work. Now, some people can't imagine a God who is in any way limited, but some thoughtful philosophers have said this is an essential way to view theodicy if you believe in free will. And the simple argument goes that God created creatures to love him 
And love requires the freedom of choice, the freedom to choose to love God. And if we're not free to choose to love God, if God is just making us love him, as Calvin would say, as God is causing us to love him, well, then it's not really love. And so free will is an essential ingredient to the existence of a world of loving beings. And in order to allow for human beings to have a certain measure of free will, God somehow in his sovereignty has limited his own power to allow us our freedom. God creates beings with a free will and then refuses to completely supersede or overpower that free will. In 1977, a philosopher named Alvin Plantinga, who's taught at Notre Dame for many years, wrote a free will defense of uh, God's uh, uh, God, uh, of a free will defense in regards to theodicy, uh, a defense of God's uh, limitation of his own power based on the necessity of free will uh, among human beings. Uh, Plantinga would say you can't have moral good without moral evil because that requires uh, the necessity of uh, free choice. A human being has to choose, be able to choose between doing right and doing wrong in order to actually choose doing right. And doing right is so valuable that God allows the choice to exist. Plantinga would write this. A world containing creatures who are significantly free and freely perform more good than evil actions is more valuable, all else being equal, than a world containing no free creatures at all. Now, God can create free creatures, but he can't cause or determine them to do only what is right. For if he does so, then they aren't significantly free at all. They do not do what is right freely. To create creatures capable of moral good, therefore, he must create cre creatures capable of moral evil. And he can't give these creatures the freedom to perform evil and at the same time prevent them from doing so. As it turns out, Sadly enough, some of the free creatures God created went wrong in the exercise of their freedom. This is the source of moral evil. The fact that free creatures sometimes go wrong, however, counts neither against God's omnipotence nor against his goodness. For he could have, for he could have forestalled the occurrence of moral evil only by removing the possibility of moral good. And so planting a, planting as uh, intention is to simply say there is not a logical contradiction between the coexistence of God's power, God's goodness, and evil. They don't logically contradict themselves. If God might have a greater reason for allowing evil uh, than uh, his reasons for uh, eliminating it entirely. So the free will defense then diminishes God's power. It says that somehow God has limited his own power to allow for human freedom because of the overwhelming value of human freedom. Uh, again, some philosophers find this one easy to break, uh, embrace. Uh, I think for the, the modern American audience, this is where a lot of theologians land. Uh, but some find this uh, unpalatable. The strict Calvinists would have nothing to do with this because God's sovereignty cannot be limited. Uh, and some, including Calvinists, would even argue that our free will is illusory. There are actually schools of philosophers uh, who are not religious, who nonetheless believe that we do not have free will of any real kind. And, uh, and so uh, a free will defense would be uh, uh, off the table for them before the conversation began. Thirdly, some theologians uh, have attempted to diminish God's goodness. Now that sounds strange. Uh, you can uh, imagine uh, this one is one that almost gets dismissed uh, from the get-go. Uh, Epicurus said that a god who wasn't good wouldn't be a god at all. And that's not really a logical argument. That's begging the question of the definition of god. But, so, but you can see the intuitive power of saying if god isn't good, he isn't god. We're not even toying with that possibility. Uh, when we use theodicy as an argument to bolster atheism, we're using it specifically to argue against a God who is a proponent of moral good, particularly the Christian God. Uh, so to diminish God's goodness seems far-fetched, but there are theologians who have attempted in one way or another to do this. 
Starting in around the 1960s, there was a new school of theological thought called liberation theology. And liberation theology said that the gospel could only be read through the lens of setting free the oppressed. God's uh, story from the book of Exodus through the life of Jesus is so interwoven with the necessity of freeing the oppressed that that is the only gospel there is. And so in light of horrific evil in the world, liberation theologians sometimes saw fit to say that in the face of horrific evil, it was appropriate to hold out in protest against the goodness of God. In fact, there's a, a school of thought called protest theology. It doesn't have a lot of proponents, but there are a few. And protest theologians look to the Psalms in which the psalmists cry out against the horrific evil uh, in the world and ask how God could be just. And they don't seek to answer their own question. They just let the question hang in the air. And protest theologians are of that camp. They see evil as so terrible that uh, God, in whatever power he has, has failed to be completely just in allowing the evils that exist in the world to continue. And so protest theologians diminish the goodness of God. That's the piece of pie that they let hang off the back of the plate. Uh, that's probably the least popular option of the three, uh, but there are some. So that's how the problem of evil and theodicy usually plays out. There are three great values that seem to stand in contradiction to one or another, or at least seem to crowd one another out. And the approach that most theologians take is simply to uh, diminish one of the three so as to give the other two full reign. Uh, you may have tuned in uh, wondering what's the right answer to those. I'm not going to answer that for you. The appropriate thing to do is to approach the question thoughtfully, read what others have written about it, read what the Bible has to say about it, pray about it, and then land thoughtfully and intentionally on the answer that seems most compelling to you. No one's ever completely satisfactorily answered the question. I'm surely not going to do so either, but I hope at least I've helped you ask the question more clearly.